Section 17 of Violets and Other Tales. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by James K. White, Chula Vista. Violets and Other Tales by Alice Moore. Section 17. In Our Neighborhood. The Harts were going to give a party. Neither Mrs. Hart, nor the Mrs. Hart, nor the small and busy Harts, who amused themselves and the neighborhood by continually falling in the gutter on special occasions, had mentioned this fact to anyone. But all the interested denizens of that particular square could tell, by the unusual air of bustle and activity which pervaded the Hart domicile, Lillian, the aesthetic, who furnished theme for many spirited discussions, leaned airily out of the window. Her auburn, red, tresses carefully done in curl papers. Martha, the practical, flourished the broom and duster with unwonted activity, which the small boys of the neighborhood, peering through the green shutters of the front door, duly reported to their mamas, busily engaged in holding down their respective doorsteps by patiently sitting thereon. Pretty soon the junior hearts, two in number, began to travel to and fro, soliciting the loan of a few chairs, some nice dishes, and such like things, indispensable to every decent, self-respecting party. But to all inquiries as to the use to which these articles were to be put, they only vouchsafed one reply. Ma told us as we wasn't to tell. Just ask for the things, that's all. Mrs. Tuckley, the dressmaker, brought her sewing out on the front steps and entered a vigorous protest to her next-door neighbor. Hmm, she sniffed. Mighty funny they can't say what's up. Must be something in it. Couldn't get none of my things and not invite me. Did she ask you for any? Absent-mindedly inquired Mrs. Luke, shielding her eyes from the sun no but she'd better since she knows me she ain't mercy me stella just look at that child tumbling in the mud you stella come here i say look at you now there and there and there the luckless stella having been soundly cuffed and sent whimpering in the back yard mrs tuckley continued yes as I was saying, of course, tain't none of my business, but I always did wonder how them hearts do keep up. Why, them girls dress just as fine as any lady on the avenue, and that there Lillian wears real diamond earrings. Pears mighty, mighty funny to me, and Lord, the airs they do put on, holding up their heads like nobody's good enough to speak to. I don't like to talk about people. You know yourself. Mrs. Luke. I never speak about anybody, but mark my word, girls that cut up capers like them Hartz's girls never come to any good. Mrs. Luke heaved a deep sigh of appreciation at the wisdom of her neighbor. But before she could reply, a reinforcement in the person of little Mrs. Peters, apron over her head, hands shriveled and soap sudsy from washing, appeared. Did you ever see the like? she asked in her usual rapid, breathless way. Why, my Lewis says they're putting canvas cloths on the floor and taking down the bed in the back room and putting greenery and such like trash about. Some style about em, eh? Mrs. Tuckley tossed her head and sniffed contemptuously. Mrs. Luke began to rehearse a time-worn tale, how once a carriage had driven up to the Hart House at nine o'clock at night, and a distinguished-looking man alighted went in, stayed about ten minutes, and finally drove off with a great clatter. Heads that had shaken ominously over this story before began to shake again, and tongues that had wagged themselves tired with conjectures started now with some brand new ideas and theories. The children of the square, tired of fishing for minnows in the ditches and making mud pies in the street, clustered about their mother's skirts, receiving occasional slaps when their attempts at taking part in the conversation became too pronounced. 
meanwhile in the hart household all was bustle and preparation to and fro the members of the house flitted arranging chairs putting little touches here and there washing saucers and glasses chasing the hart juniors about losing things and calling frantically for each other's assistance to find them mama hart big plump and perspiring puffed here and there like a large rosy engine giving impossible orders and receiving sharp answers to foolish questions lillian the aesthetic practiced her most graceful poses before the large mirror in the parlor martha rushed about changing the order of the furniture and papa hart just come in from work paced the rooms disconsolately asking for dinner dinner screamed mama hart dinner who's got time to fool with dinner this evening look at the sideboard and you'll see some bread and ham eat that and shut up eight o'clock finally arrived and with it the music and some straggling guests when the first faint chee chee of the violin floated out into the murky atmosphere the smaller portion of the neighborhood went straight away into ecstasies boys and girls in all stages of dishabla clustered about the doorsteps and gave vent to audible exclamations of approval or disapprobation concerning the state of affairs behind the green shutters it was a warm night and the big round moon sailed serenely in a cloudless blue sky mrs tuckley had put on a clean calico wrapper and planted herself with the indomitable stella on her steps to watch the proceedings the party was a grand success even the intensely critical small fry dancing on the pavement without to the scraping and fiddling of the string band had to admit that so far as they were concerned it was all right but what shall we say of the guests within they who glided easily over the canvassed floors bowed and scraped and simpered just like the big folks on the avenue who ate the ice cream and cake and drank the sweet weak catawba wine amid boisterous healths to mr and mrs hart and the mrs hart who smirked and perspired and cracked ancient jokes and heart-rending puns during the intervals of the dances who shall say that they did not enjoy themselves as thoroughly and as fully as those who frequented the wealthier entertainments of town lillian and martha in gossamer gowns of pink and blue flitted to and fro attending to the wants of their guests mrs hart gorgeous in a black satin affair all folds and lace and drapery made desperate efforts to appear cool and collected and failed miserably papa hart spent one half his time standing in front of the mantel spreading out his coat-tails and benignly smiling upon the young people while the other half was devoted to initiating the male portion of the guests into the mysteries of snake killing everybody had said that he or she had had a splendid time and finally, when the last kisses had been kissed, the last goodbyes been said, the whole Hart family sat down in the now deserted and disordered rooms, and sighed with relief that the great event was over at last. "'Nice crowd, eh?' remarked Papa Hart. He was brimful of joy and second-class whiskey, so no one paid any attention to him." "'But did you see how shamefully Maud flirted with Willie Howard?' said Lillian. Martha tossed her head in disdain. Mr. Howard she had always considered her especial property, so Lillian's observation had a rather disturbing effect. "'I'm so warm and tired,' cried Mama Hart plaintively. "'Children, how are we going to sleep tonight?' thereupon the whole family arose to devise ways and means of wooing the drowsy god as for the hart juniors they had long since solved the problem by falling asleep with sticky hands and faces upon a pile of bedclothing behind the kitchen door it was late in the next day before the house had begun to resume anything like its former appearance the little hearts were kept busy all morning returning chairs and dishes 
and distributing the remnants of the feast to the vicinity the ice cream had melted into a warm custard and the cakes had a rather worse for wear appearance but they were appreciated as much as though just from the confectioner no one was forgotten even mrs tuckley busily stitching on a muslin garment on the steps and unctuously rolling the latest morsel of scandal under her tongue was obliged to confess that them heartses wasn't such bad people after all just a bit queer at times about two o'clock just as lillian was redraping the tidies on the stiff common plush chairs in the parlor someone pulled the bell violently the visitor a rather good-looking young fellow with a worried expression smiled somewhat sarcastically as he heard a sound of scuffling and running within the house presently mrs hart opened the door wiping her hand red and smoking with dishwater upon her apron the worried expression deepened on the visitor's face as he addressed the woman with visible embarrassment uh, i i suppose you are mrs hart he inquired awkwardly that's my name sir replied she with pretentious dignity uh, you're may i come in madam certainly and she opened the door to admit him and offered a chair your husband is an employee in the fisher oil mills is he not mrs hart straightened herself with pride as she replied in the affirmative she had always been proud of mr hart's position as foreman of the big oil mills and was never so happy as when he was expounding to someone in her presence the difficulties and intricacies of machine work well you see my dear mrs hart continued the visitor now pray don't get excited there has been an accident and your husband has uh, been hurt you know but for a painful whitening in her usually rosy face and a quick compression of her lips the wife made no sign what was the accident she queried leaning her elbows on her knees well you see i don't understand machinery and the like but there was something about a wheel out of gear and a band bursted or something anyhow a big wheel flew to pieces and as he was standing near he was hit where well well i may as well tell you the truth madam a large piece of the wheel struck him on the head and he was killed instantly she did not faint nor make any outcry nor tear her hair as he had partly expected but sat still staring at him with a sort of helpless dumb horror shining out of her eyes then with a low moan bowed her head on her knees and shuddered just as julian came in curious to know what the handsome stranger had to say to her mother the poor mutilated body came home at last and was laid in a stiff silver decorated black coffin in the middle of the sitting-room which had been made to look as uncomfortable and unnatural as mirrors and furniture shrouded in sheets and mantle and tables divested of ornaments would permit there was a wake that night to the unconfined joy of the neighbors who would rather a burial than a wedding the friends of the family sat about the coffin and through the house with long pulled faces mrs tuckley officiated in the kitchen making coffee and dispensing cheese and crackers to those who were hungry as the night wore on and the first restraint disappeared jokes were cracked and quiet laughter indulged in while the young folks congregated in the kitchen were hilariously happy until some member of the family would appear when every face would sober down the older persons contented themselves with recounting the virtues of the deceased and telling anecdotes wherein he figured largely it was astonishing how many intimate friends of his had suddenly come to light every other man present had either attended school with him or was a close companion until he died proverbs and tales and witty sayings were palmed off as having emanated from his lips 
in fact the dead man would have been surprised himself had he suddenly come to life and discovered what an important what a modern solomon he had become the long night dragged on and the people departed in groups of twos and threes until when the gray dawn crept slowly over the blackness of night shrouding the electric lights in mists of cloudy blue and sending cold chills of dampness through the house but a few of the great crowd remained the day seemed so gray in contrast to the softening influence of the night the grief which could be hidden then must now come forth and parade itself before all eyes there was the funeral to prepare for the dismal black dresses and bonnets with their long crape veils to don there were the condolences of sorrowing friends to receive the floral offerings to be looked at the little hearts strutted about resplendent in stiff black cravats and high crape bands about their hats they were divided between two conflicting emotions joy at belonging to a family so noteworthy and important and sorrow at the death as the time for the funeral approached and lillian began to indulge in a series of fainting fits the latter feeling predominated well it was all over at last the family had returned and as on two nights previous sat once more in the deserted and dismantled parlor mrs tuckley and mrs luke having rendered all assistance possible had repaired to their respective front steps to keep count of the number of visitors who returned to condole with the family a real nice funeral remarked the dressmaker at last a nice funeral everybody took it so hard and lillian fainted real beautiful she's a good girl that lillian poor things i wonder what they'll do now stella the irrepressible was busily engaged balancing herself on one toe a la ballet maybe she's going to get married she volunteered eagerly cause i saw that yellow-haired young man what comes there all the time with his arms around her waist and a tellin her not to grieve as he'd take care of her i was a peepin in the dining room how dare you peep at other folks and pry into people's affairs i can't imagine where you get your meddlesome ways from there ain't none in my family next time i catch you at it i'll spank you good then after a pause well what else did he say end of section 17 recording by james k white chula vista